Well, welcome everyone. This is Antoine Thompson with uh, Greater Washington Region Clean Cities Coalition. We are so excited uh, to be here today. I have a we have a very cool guest with us today, and uh, a lot has been happening uh, in the industry as well. A lot has happened uh, since our last podcast. Uh, so much is going on in clean energy, clean transportation, um, building sustainability. Uh, the air in our country is like really out of control right now. Uh, coming out of COVID-19, uh, people are starting to wear a mask again when we go outside. And, and they're talking about respiratory, the, the impact of the air on, on public health. Uh, again, and and that's kind of why clean cities were started over 30 years ago, actually 30 years ago this year. Um, but I want to um, um, I want to thank um, our speaker and a guest today, Mr. Ron Pathea, who is the president and founder of Positive Change Purchasing Cooperative, uh, focused on solar and renewable energy uh, as well and the Purchasing Cooperative located in Baltimore, Maryland, and covers uh, Metro DC and beyond. Uh, we're gonna talk today um, about uh, Justice 40, uh, which was an executive order signed uh, by uh, President Biden. And not enough people know about Justice 40. I actually, every chance I get, when I'm at community meetings, I, in fact, I spoke at one a couple of days ago, and I'm amazed at how many people don't know about um, Justice 40. And so we're going to talk about that. That's Executive Order 14008, uh, which says that 40% of overall benefits of certain federal investments flow to disadvantaged communities, communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by pollution. Justice 40 is the first legis legislation of its kind uh, to confront environmental justice and inequities uh, and disparities uh, based on uh, race, class, neighborhood, and communities. Uh, the categories of investment are climate change, clean energy, and efficiency, clean transit, affordable and sustainable housing, workforce development, remediation and reduction of legacy pollution, both in land and in water, uh, wastewater as well. And, and um, you know, many of us think about uh, Flint, Michigan, and a few years ago in 2016, there was a lot of talk about Flint, Michigan and the water quality. But the fact of the matter is that there's a Flint, Michigan in many areas of the country, and there are many communities around the country that actually have worse water quality in Flint, Michigan today. That's an untold story. The other thing is that um, there are so many people that, especially communities of color, that spend a disproportionate amount of their monthly income on energy costs. And that needs to be addressed as well. And then the big elephant in the room is the fact that so many people of color think that asthma is hereditary, that it's not treatable, and that it's something that they've done nothing wrong uh, to inherit a, a disease that is actually not something you inherit. It's a product of your environment, your built environment, your transportation environment, and it's not genetic. And so hopefully, as we move through this conversation, we can talk about the opportunities with Justice 40, why it matters, and what can we do about it to make sure that um, we're in an imperfect country, an imperfect union, um, but this is a time where Americans are really starting to pay attention to the environment again. And Justice 40 is a great way that we can make sure that as we make these investments, that we don't make the disparities even worse than they currently are. So without further ado, I wanna welcome Ron. Good to see you. How are you doing, sir? Been quite busy, been quite busy, Brother Antoine. It's been a very, very 
sobering day for me, being that I'm uh, from the era of uh, the baby boomers that were the first ones, the ones who stood in the lines, who were at the uh, uh, counters uh, protesting uh, access to uh, be able to eat where you wanted to eat by the Supreme Court, striking down race as a qualifying of entity a consideration after 400 years of chattel slavery and 200 years of Jim Crow in this country for, for folks of my view of African descent. Uh, it's a very sobering day, but I appreciate you having me on. I think we can talk about Justice 40. We, I would like to look at some of the policy flaws of the law. It came out of Biden signing 14008 which was his first executive order when he came to office. From that, it gave rise to the, uh, the other 139856, which says that 40% of the benefit of the Build Back Better Inflation Reduction Act must go to communities of color now. They went on to define that, but even more than that, most of our people have never heard the name Dr. Denise Fairchild, who is one of our leading economists in this country, who in fact wrote a playbook for African Americans called the People's Justice Community Benefit Playbook a guide to capturing federal infrastructure investment dollars. Now, this work that she put together, the playbook offers frontline groups and community organizations guidance for developing the People's Justice 40 Plus Community Benefit Plan. The goal is to ensure that the infrastructure and climate investments significantly benefit communities that need them the most. A successful CBP will harness the infrastructure investments of major federal incentives such as infrastructure investment and jobs act to meet communities needs. Resources are also relevant in other current and future infrastructure, local, state, and federal levels for environmental reparations climate resilience, and addressing health and disparities in marginal communities. The playbook will answer a range of questions about the different federal spending bills to benefit from these, who benefits from these funds, who need what you need to know. What are the various bills? How much money is, is available? What kind of money is it? Grants, loans, and contracts. What are the restrictions? Who can the money be, what can the money can be used for? How will the money flow from the federal governments to state and local governments? Who is eligible to get the money? What are the potential community benefits? How can the influence, how can you influence how the money is spent? How can you organize your community to benefit a strategy and a plan? Where can you get more information and technical support. Now, all this information is on my website. That particular article can be found at positivechangepc.com. There's one other must, I must recommend this article that's also on my news and events tab. And it talks about the fact sheet that the Biden-Harris administration is investing $375 billion through the Infl Inflation Reduction Act, and it gives you each state how much money each state gets for each aspect. It goes from water, electric buses, infrastructure. It provides everything being spent in each state of the union, the District of Columbia and territories. Now you will also find that under our, my news and events tab. When you connect the dots back to Justice Sporting 
People must understand where Justice Sporty came from. It came out of California. You had people such as Van Jones, Reverend Curl with Green the Church, African American organizations that work with Native American organizations, Hispanic environmental justice organizations. They went to San Clemente, California, the capital, and they were able to get a state delegate to introduce the bill, and it was voted by the state legislature into law. New York, Delaware, and believe it or not, my home state, uh, red state of home state of South Carolina, because of James Clyburn, because of Biden coming out of Delaware, because of the National Action Network and Reverend Sharpton and other interest groups in New York State who went and lobbied and advocated, they got Justice 40 adopted through the state legislature. What does this mean? It means that the infrastructure billions of dollars which you will see in laid out state by state that that money that has gone to those states must be spent for the purposes it was mm -hmm. sent to those states and those counties that have the greatest need based on zip code and other data they are able to apply for these grants if they don't go get these grants. And then they, I called the U.S. Attorney's Office here in the state of Maryland and found out if the legislature, legislation was passed and adopted in Maryland, and if a nonprofit or a business entity felt that their community was passed over, they could come to the U.S. Attorney's Office of that county and ask them to look into the matter. It gives the community and it gives people somewhere to go with something with somebody with some power and teeth to make sure we get our fair share. This is not a level playing field, ladies and gentlemen. Let me explain. No, no one, one second, right, right on that point. I want to get to some um, some other uh, questions on here. So Ron, um, when you, for those who may not know who disadvantaged communities impacted by climate change are, what, what do you, when you think of, uh, how would you define disadvantaged community communities impacted by climate change, in your opinion? Well, I'm not going to use my opinion. I'm going to go to the federal government's definition of what an impacted community is. This sure. is what our communities have to understand. That based on the total number of projects that I mentioned when I first opened up, these things didn't just pop up since the Build Back Better and Infrastructure Inflation Reduction Act was proposed through Congress and passed through Congress. This started back in 2008 with Obama's administration. You have had collaborations between every other ethnicity and group in this country have come together around these challenges that are facing us today. They have gone to their state senators and congressmen and positioned themselves. And they were in those brain sessions as people came together to get input around how this money must be parceled out to, through to the states. So this is what Dr. Fairchild laid out in her document called a 100% approach, because she lays out the fact that based on what? Environmental injustices that the African-American community, even though someone does not want to use race, but the NAAC legal defense group have, they've done the studies. We have the data. We know that our communities in, for example, Cancer Alley down in New Orleans, EPA today just dropped the case that African Americans bought concerning the high cancer rates in Louisiana, in, in New Orleans, around the refineries, and the impacts they have on the African and African American communities there, which are disproportionately when we look at our situations in the where, in, as it relates to rural co-ops. 92% of the most distressed and poor communities are served by rural co-ops. They use what? Oil and gas. The transition over to renewables 
because they're in restricted markets, you you get log jam with the political geopolitics of who's going to be first in the preventing processes and getting through the zoning board. So they have a million ways that our communities who, and we have people out here who've been working diligently, but we haven't gotten our fair share. So, yeah, let me, so, so, so let me go to the next question if we can. Um, what do you, uh, Justice Forty uh, has a lot of promise. It's not perfect, right? Uh, like any piece of uh, legislation or executive order. Uh, but what would you say, if you could say two of the big benefits of Justice 40, what would you name those two benefits to be? I don't see the benefits right now because there's too much money flowing out of the door and it's too many excuses being made by federal agencies. When I've gone to nonprofit organizations who uh, African-American HBCUs and other entities that's going at these grants and they haven't been funded. So right now, until I can, as the little, the little boy says, show me the check. Until I can get a better gauge on how much of this funding is actually reaching our institutions and our communities. And I understand the process because we don't have the capacity in, in the grant writers, but even that aspect of it has not gotten out to our communities that there's funding out here to help these rural communities get grant writers and, 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 it, and, and it can be paid for by federal dollars coming out of these programs. But who's out there beating the drum to get that message out? Antoine, these are the problems I see with Justice 40. I see very little engagement with education to the people who need to have the information. If you get to talking about the World Council of Mayors and historic townships, the Honorable Johnny Forge Group, I, 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 I'm on those Zoom calls pretty consistently. I've seen nobody, nobody from the Department of Energy, EPA, come on, a commerce to come on to talk about these opportunities. I have been providing opportunities and talking about these grant opportunities for these rural communities and giving them reports. So if you're asking me where I see the problem, I see the problem because those of us who, and I do produce, produce a podcast myself called Stolen Now in the Future with its Economic Impact on Black America. And getting the necessary monies to, to, to the people who have boots on the ground that are doing the work to buy media time to mainstream what the message to the African-American through Black talk, digital, electronic, and radio media until I see some serious investment coming from somewhere other than some conversation. I, I don't have an answer to that question because I don't see the benefits. I really can't see the benefits at this so, time. So let me let me go to the next question. Thanks for your uh, that. I know that there's been some progress, but we got a lot more work to do, especially given how much money is on the table uh, as well. Uh, how can we build it? On your point, building on that, how do we how do we um, make sure? You talked about, uh, you know, outreach from the digital and in public relations. But what do we? What else do we need to do to ensure that impact the communities know about Justice Forty funding and are able to access it? If you were able to have a conversation with President Biden or or one of the Bud Secretary Buttigieg or or one of the other secretaries from. Um, Grand Home or, or, or any of the other ones from the EPA administrator um, or the HUD secretary, Fudge, what would you say to them on, uh, you know, if you had two or, three, two or three things you could say to them on how they make sure that communities can access this funding, what would those three things be? There's one thing to fund Emerald Cities to give them the research, research the playbook and the strategy together. It's a great plan. But if nobody knows about the plan, we, it, 
the strategy that was laid out by Dr. Fairchild's Emerald Cities collaboration, I strongly suggest and recommend everyone to go to my website. You can click on the li link. You can download the PDF. Each PDF, they have one for transportation. They got one on environmental justice. These different playbooks and strategies, it lays out what should be done first. I strongly exhibit, uh, 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 recommend to the listening audience to go take that plan and put that in place in your community and try to organize through a, a structured strategy that has already been laid out and follow that it, uh, uh, as a model for you to try to do something in your community because each community's needs are going to be different than others. But that is my recommendation right now. And I'm working, as you are quite aware, with my state delegate, Mrs. Dana Tarvez here in Maryland. Uh, she uh, was just elected to represent uh, me in the, in the state. Uh, as my state delegate, she's going to be introducing the Justice Florida legislation in the fall to try to get the state legislature to, to pass legislation to adopt it here in Maryland so it can be legally binding. I've reached out to Reverend Al Sharpton, which I'm a member of his organization, the National, uh, 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 National Action Network, uh, uh, Mr. Larry Young, who uh, is in Baltimore who's the statewide leader chapter. We've spoken about this to get his support. So we have to work where we are and do what we can do because the challenges for our young people, I've got a 10 year, a 10 year old grandson. With this decision coming down from the Supreme Court today, it's serious, brother. It is. So let me ask you um, this other question here. Uh, Justice, uh, how can we build a green economy that works for those who would not have, that works for those who have been historically um, excluded? Well, the way we do that, we first got to educate our folks. This is just the point. Last year around this time, I worked very hard with a in pulling together a national group to, because I'm president of the National Association of Blacks and Sola also. And NABS, we pulled together two Galoo colleges, our lead fiduciary, my vice president of the National Association, Mr. Will Shirley out of Jackson, Mississippi, a, a Sundial Solar, Solar Times USA, Mrs. Janelle Menefit out of uh, Columbus, Georgia, out of Atlanta, we had a, a young uh, group, nonprofit group, Global Apprenticeships, two young brothers who have a, a contract with the Department of Labor to place our young people in jobs after they get their NAPSET certifications. Here in Washington, Mr. Mark Davis, WDC Solar, his firm was a partner. Out of Baltimore, we had Power 52, Ray Lewis, NFL Hall of Famer, Mrs. Cherie Brooks. They have a training economy in Howard County. They service returning citizens and low in, in modern in, uh, low and modern income residents in Baltimore with workforce development training. We went after a $19 million grant under the Good Jobs Challenge under the Department of Commerce, $500 million, 529 applications. Out of that, we had eight HBCUs at 11 applications, only two were on renewable energy, uh, was on energy was Tougaloo's ap application, our application, Sustainability Across America, that would have trained 750 young people in seven states to be energy auditors, electrician for EV charging infrastructure, wiring, and commercial and residential, and installers for PV systems on rooftop solar, where we weren't successful and getting a grant, but out of $500 million and me checking and doing some due diligence and other African-American nonprofits, only one received one grant, which was North Carolina a and 23.7 million. That's a good thing. But partnering with Siemens and Duke Energy, to me, doesn't necessarily grow market share for African-American-based renewable energy firms. That's the point. So 
We have companies that ha have proven track records and boots on the grounds. By us not getting this, we would have had the model for everybody else to get. Well, on that point, the EDA just made another announcement for funding that's going to be due in October, another few hundred million dollars. I, I just so. got off the webinar. Repeat. You know, I just got off the webinar. I've been okay. on three webinars today. I spent all of my time following up, following up, following up, and I, I, I load the information under news and events. We probably have the most complete database of research of grant opportunities coming out of the federal government that we've made available to the African and African-American community worldwide. So what I'm saying is, yeah, this is another opportunity, but I understand the competition, see? It's not a level playing field. I keep telling folks, we have to go to our congressional leaders after congressional hearings and ask for carve outs. If they can pull, pump $1 billion into Puerto Rico for renewable energy, uh, upgrades to combat climate change, if Native Americans can receive $150 million to put TV systems on the roof of, of homes on reservations, and there's not a one carve out dime for African Americans specifically because you can't use race. Yes, you can. They did it for the PPP program. We need to yeah. do well, we just had we just had a decision that came down today, my bro. We gotta keep fighting, man. We yeah, well, I've been fighting. I've been. That's what I'm saying. I I was one of the ones who who broke the tether line in the state of South Carolina as an athlete, I, and and I broke a lot of other barriers. But I won't toot my own horn. I'm not here for that. All I'm saying to you is I understand that. But at some point in time, we pay taxes too. And Dr. King says, America has given a check to African-Americans mark insufficient funds. And I'm telling you, it's past time for someone to start talking about reparations as it relates to this Build Back Better and this Infrastructure Reduction Act. Because our communities, through Government policy and redlining and racial discrimination, when we look from the GI Bill on back and, and from, from the Civil War, we know what the story is. So they can't come with this here, uh, well, we don't want to talk about this because it ain't popular. Well, we well, ain't woke. Me, no, we let, need let to me, be paid. We let, need to get paid for our, our, our communities because the, our future in the new green economy, our future is now. Ryan, I want to thank you for um, putting so much content around the funding opportunities on your website. And uh, if you can uh, let people know um, how they can find your website, can you, can you say it again? It's positive change. P as in Paul, C as in cat.com. That's positive change, pc.com. Just click on our news and events tab. You want to go, you stroll down, you, and, and each month it rolls over. We have a lot of data because there's a lot of things going on out here in this energy sector. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, it's busy and everybody seems to be getting paid our African-American companies and developers. Matter of fact, out of 11,000 companies doing business, we got less than 50 African-American companies in the whole country. So if you want to know if we have a disparity problem in this arena, you don't have to take my word. You go to the Solar Foundation website, sia.org. So we got a lot of work to do. So uh, Same one, if you can't win, we got a lot of work to do. So let me just get to the last question for you. And I got some closing comments. Uh, how does your organization uh, advocate for environmental justice locally and nationally? Well, what we try to do to advocate is, as, as I said we produce a podcast called Solar Now and the Future with its economic impact on 
Black America. And we can be heard also through the same website. Uh, we're on iTunes. We can be heard over Facebook, Twitter, and Link. We bring people from of African and African American descent on our podcast that deals who have organizations with boots on the ground dealing around environmental justice issues. And we try to connect dots as to this is why we need to see some economic reinvestment in our communities to uplift our communities rather than what has already been put on our communities by design governmental design. When we begin to start studying urban planning, housing, federal highway systems, we will find out about real institutionalized racism. So with that being said, we need to follow the playbook that Dr. Denise Fairchild's organizations have laid out, developed strategies, and move. We don't have time to play games. It's all hands on deck. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, Ron for being on our show. Uh, this is Antoine Thompson, Executive Director of Greater Washington Region Clean Cities Coalition. This is the 30th year anniversary of Clean Cities. We are one of uh, 75 offices from uh, spanning from D.C. all the way to Hawaii. And we call ourselves the, the organization of Greater Washington Region Clean Cities Coalition. We cover D.C., uh, Northern Virginia, and Maryland, and we're actually expanding all the way to Baltimore uh, to provide leadership, uh, project management, uh, community engagement, uh, technical support, and, and helping communities access the funding that Ron was talking about, not only at, not only at the federal level, but also at the state and local level and, and, and in the private sector as well. There's uh, significant uh, disparities that exist uh, in transportation and, and the environment and in the energy sector. And if we're not intentional, uh, with, despite all the good faith efforts and the executive orders and the laws that have been passed at the federal, state, and local level, every time we examine what's working and what's not working. We find that the disparities are persisting and they're not going down, but they often get worse. So it requires leadership, tenacity, advocacy, and opportunity as well for African-Americans and other communities that have been historically um, disadvantaged uh, with higher rates of, of uh, asthma and COPD and other Ill illnesses people who live closer to railroad lines that have uh, diesel emissions and bad air quality and factories and bus depots. People with, who have live in neighborhoods where they're like Flint, Michigan with uh, poor water quality uh, and people who have paid a disproportionate amount of their, of their uh, rent and their um, utility bills on on, on energy and electricity costs. So that's why we're here and hopefully Justice 40 will make those uh, situations better. It won't be easy, but as we know in America, you have to fight for it and you gotta show up and sometime you gotta show out. Uh, but we're, we're committed to doing our part at Greater Washington Region Clean Cities uh, to be advocates for change. There's a lot of funding that's out there and we wanna partner and collaborate with people to get it done. Our ultimate goal is to make sure that people live longer and healthier lives, that all communities uh, benefit from these public and private sector investments. Without further ado, I wanna thank our team for getting our special guests on the show today. And until next time, let's continue to make America uh, greener and cleaner and make sure we work with more green leaders that are on the move. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Green Leaders on the Move with Antoine Thompson. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others. 
post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest trends in clean energy and transportation from the Greater Washington Region Clean Cities Coalition, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GWRCCC. Thanks again. See you next time.